My job was to, our jobs were to intercept via radio signals certain messages and things from our Cold War enemies. And when I was first assigned to that unit, uh, it was very difficult to locate our targets. Now, what I mean by that is radio frequencies. You'd search for these guys sending messages, but we didn't have all their frequencies. We, we, we had been weakened severely because a few years prior to that, a guy who worked for the CIA or the NSA, I can't remember which one, had defected to the Soviet Union and revealed to them a lot of our secret methods of intercepting messages and breaking codes and that kind of thing. So they changed up everything. And this guy was caught, he was convicted and sent to prison. And this is an illustration of what results when we try to serve two masters. He was trying to serve on the surface the United States government and its military, but he was also serving the masters in the Kremlin. And it created, it caused people to die because he released, he uh, revealed the identities of some of our agents in Russia. To serve two masters doesn't work. And we're going to talk about that today, as you may have guessed. We'll be in Romans chapter 6. There you go. Finishing up the chapter from what we started last week. We're going to talk about a change of masters today. So I ask you a question, who's your master? Who's your master? Okay, I'm hearing some, yeah, that's good, that's good. Should, could be better. Who's your master? Listen, slavery to sin leads to death. And I'm talking spiritual death. Slavery to God results in sanctification and eternal life. So we're going to look at these passages, and we're going to pull out some some pretty powerful stuff. So I'd like you to turn, if you haven't already, to your Bible, Romans chapter 6, verse 15. And I'm not just going to read it. I'm going to comment on it a little as we go through it. So I don't know if you like to make notes in your Bible, but this would be a good time to get your pencil ready. Now to remind you before we read it, in the first part of chapter 6, Paul is writing to the church in the city of Rome, and he's explaining to them that they no longer are bound by sin because they have died to it. Now, we're talking spiritual death, and he explains how when Christ hung on the cross, figuratively, we hung there as well. And when he was buried, he was dead, and so were we, and we were buried with him, symbolized by baptism. And so he's telling us, Christians, he's saying, You've died to sin. Can a dead person sin? No. But what he means is you are no longer under sin's authority. You are no longer under the power of sin. You see, the illustration is made here and in other places. There's two types of people in the world. And you just shuck it right down to the cob, okay? There's people who know Jesus Christ who have died to sin and are no longer under its power and authority. They can choose to sin, but they don't have to anymore. So I just told you who the second group is. The second group are people who do not know Christ, and they have no choice. They have a sin nature that rules over them, and they live in sin. And so to be delivered from that, one must put their faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross. And so now, in this section of chapter 6, Paul is going to take the same argument, and he's going to work it out to explain how we were slaves to sin, but now we're slaves to God. So follow along with me, verse 15. Paul's asking the question, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? Now the law here, the law here, think Ten Commandments. Way back in the Old Testament, when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were the standard that God set for righteousness and holiness. But we've already learned as we've been going through the book of Romans that no one has ever been able to obey those Ten Commandments. I, you know, we joke here sometimes, and I ask you, how many of you have ever broken one of the Ten Commandments? And every arm in the room goes up. And it should, because we've all broken them. 
And God is a holy God, and he cannot tolerate sin in his presence. And so the law is something that many people try to gain favor from God. They try to gain righteousness and salvation by being obedient and not recognizing grace. See, if, if there's one word that is the watchword of my ministry here, it is grace. We are saved by God's grace. And what is grace? Unmerited favor, undeserved, unearned. God, for his own, own practical purposes, looked at each of us in this room who is a Christian and said, you're going to be mine. I'm going to show you my favor and bring you to myself and your faith, which I will give you, your faith in Christ will assign to you his righteousness and you'll be forgiven. And we're going to expand on that, of course, as we go. But you see in verse, six, uh, verse 1 in chapter 6, Paul asks almost the same question. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? You know, there were some people who were saying back then when Paul was teaching this controversial theology of salvation by grace, by God's grace, they were saying, well, then if God's grace is all we need, then we just need to go out and sin all we want because we'll be forgiven. Paul, in both of these sections of this chapter, he's putting that argument to bed. He said, no, that's not what happens. Now let's look at what he says about it. By no means, the King James Version says, God forbid. That is not the case. And he says in verse 16, do you not know? Remember, he's talking to the church. These are supposed to be Christians. So he's saying, do you not know? Because they've already been taught this. He's reminding them, do you not know that if you present or yield yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey. Okay, that's deep. Sure. And he goes on, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. So he's laying out two options, and only two. Verse 17. I love it when I see the word but in Scripture, because that usually means good news for us. Verse 17, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart or, or wholeheartedly obedient to the standard of teaching to which you were entrusted or committed. In other words, you have been saved. He's telling the church, Christians in that church, you have been saved, delivered from being a slave to sin because of your obedience, your wholehearted. This is sincere, heartfelt, not fake obedience to the word of Christ. Verse 18, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Now, I know we have a problem with the word slave because we have imprinted in our minds, if we've studied history at all, about the slavery that used to exist in the United States. Well, if that bothers you, then just substitute the word servant. Substitute the word servant because actually the Greek word can be translated both ways. So we have become servants of righteousness. Now this is through Christ. This is not through any good works of our own. Then he says, because he knows he's speaking to, to weak human beings, he said, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members or your body parts or yourselves as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. Listen to what he's telling you here. This is great. He's saying, before you came to Christ, you presented yourself. You willingly presented yourself to sin. The members, the parts of your body, your whole self. You gave it into it. You, you, it was you. It was in control of you. But he's saying, now you don't have to be that way anymore. You don't have to. He says, present or offer or yield yourself as slaves or servants to righteousness leading to sanctification. You see, now we have been delivered from that slavery. That slavery, in, in the history of slavery, it's almost impossible for a slave to, be, to free himself from it, particularly in the type of slavery that we had in this country. But now, because of Christ, that bondage has been severed. But we have to act on it, folks. This is where it gets. It gets to people because... 
they think, well, I thought I just had to get saved. You see, my message has been since I've been here, when I talk about the gospel, there's two parts to it. I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but let's just look at it this way. Faith in Christ is what brings salvation. But then, and you don't hear this preached in a lot of places, obedience. He calls us to follow him and obey him. It is not an option. Now, this obedience is not legalism. This type of obedience is the obedience that comes from a transformed heart who loves his Lord and wants to follow him and be like him. But he's telling you here what you've got to do. Now, present yourself as a servant to righteousness leading to sanctification. He tells you another important thing here, too. When you present yourself or yield yourself to the power of the Holy Spirit that now inhabits you, God begins a process of sanctification. Now, what is sanctification? In its purest meaning, it means separation. It means to be separated from. But here it means a process of becoming more and more like Christ. That's the end game for you, Christian. Did you know that? God has his purpose for you. And people say, what's my purpose on this planet? Christian, I can tell you your purpose. Your purpose is to become more like Christ. More and more every day. And you can't do it without him. This is where we have to present ourselves to righteousness. Think Jesus. Present yourself to Jesus, and he'll take you into sanctification. You know, this, this is an active verb. Pres present. It's an active verb. It's an action you take. Have you ever thought about doing this in your morning quiet time? Maybe you need to start doing it. When you're praying, when you're going through the scriptures, you've got a time with the Lord, tell him, Lord, I present myself to you for sanctification. You know, God will answer that prayer if you mean it. If you're his and you mean it, he will begin or continue, if he's already begun, the process of sanctification. Does that mean that at some point in our lives we will never sin again? No. Some people who don't, outside the church, they hear talk like this and they think, oh, so you Christians think you're perfect or you think you're going to become perfect. Nothing could be further from the truth. But what should be seen in the life of a growing Christian is an increase in sanctification, holiness, obedience, and a decrease in sin. That should be readily apparent to both the Christian and those who observe their lives. And then in verse 20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. It's kind of an odd uh, juxtaposition that he's making here, or comparison. But he's saying, back when you were lost, before you came to Christ, before you got saved, you were free from righteousness. So flip the coin over on the other side. That's what's going to happen. That's what's happened to you when you've come to Christ in faith. God's grace has delivered you from death. He's delivered you from sin, and you are no longer in its power. And now you're a servant of righteousness. And then you ask him a question. But what fruit? That word could also be translated benefit. So let's read it like that. But what benefit were you getting at that time when you were lost from the things of which you are now ashamed? There's a good question that can be asked here. Are you ashamed of your former life? Do you look back on how you lived and how you were before you got saved? And are you ashamed of it? Now, I'm not talking about being overcome by shame because we've been delivered from that too. But when we look back, if, the, if God allows us to remember back to how we were before we came to him, then almost definitely there are things you can remember that you're ashamed of. But he's saying now you're ashamed of those things for the end of those things is death. The end, the consequences of those things is death. But now, ah, there's that but a word again. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God or servants of God, the fruit or benefit you get leads to, again, there's that word, sanctification, and he adds something. And it's end, eternal life. Let me ask you a question. Has eternal life begun for you yet, if you're a Christian? 
This is kind of a trick question. If you're a Christian here today, it has begun. It's just at some point in the future, there will be a transition from your physical body to your spiritual body. And then when Christ returns, you'll get your glorified body back. That's another sermon. But if you've come to Christ, if you've placed your faith in him and you know you're saved, you are going to live forever. Can I get an amen? Jeez. Why are you afraid? Why, why fear anything? Why are you afraid of coronavirus? Yeah, people are freaking out. You know, you watch the news, and they're breathless, aren't they? Oh, another four cases have broken out in Nashville. What, what, oh, my goodness. You know, I ain't afraid of that virus. No, I'm not going to do anything stupid. You know, I'm not going to go ask an infected person to breathe on me. But one of the things holding back many Christians is fear. Nod your head if you agree. Yeah. I can't tell you anything that will make you just stop being afraid of anything. But you need to understand something. You have been delivered from that. You are no longer a slave to sin, death, fear, shame, or guilt. There's no place for it in your life anymore. Yes, in your weak moments, you can give yourself up to it. Can you not? When I get something that pops into my head that is fearsome, you know, that could cause fear, I mean, I, I'm, I'm weak too sometimes, you know? I said, no. I'm going to be with Jesus one of these days. And I'm going to see my lost loved ones. And whichever one of us goes first, we're going to meet up again with me and my wife. I'm not afraid of that. Now, do I want a quick and painless death when I go? Of course. That's not up to me. We have eternal life, and we should be living like people who know they're going to live forever. But let's go back to the sanctification thing. I have not even gotten to my notes yet. Maybe I won't. <laughs> A great Bible scholar, his name is F.F. F. Bruce, wrote this. If a man is not being sanctified, there is no reason to believe he has been justified. Read that again. If a man is not, or a woman, is not being sanctified, there is no reason to believe he has been justified. So what that means is if there is no evident change in a person, who claims to know Christ. And I mean, they're, they're not sinning any less. And, and I mean over a period of time. They have no desire for the things of God. They have no desire to be with the people of God. They have no desire to get into this book. They don't care about praying or any of that. There's no sanctification. There's a very good chance, almost certain, that they have not been justified. And what did we learn in the early chapters of Romans? Justification by faith. That means being, to put it simply, being saved. Technically, it means that God has assigned to you, once on your profession of faith, the righteousness of Christ, and all of your sin and guilt has been put on him at the cross. That's when the transformation begins. And so the idea here, the reason he keeps harping on sanctification, is because it is a perennial problem in the church. It, is, it was there then, and it's here today, that people are sitting in warming chairs and pews in churches all over this country who think they're saved and they're not. I, I, you know, there's a lot of reasons why a person could think that. Maybe they've been sitting at the feet of false teachers, or maybe they think because they got baptized, they're saved, or they are a member of the church. Oh, I'm a member of the church. I must be going to heaven. Or their parents raised them in the church. There could be numerous reasons. But one day, I'm going to stand before God. And he's going to hold me accountable for how I shepherd this flock. And every pastor in the world is also going to go through the same thing. And some of them are going to have some tough answers, or questions to answer. Check on Matthew 25 sometime and read the story of the goats and the sheep. It's a... Uh, depiction of when Christ returns and he goes to separate 
his church. There's depicted there a very sad story of people who thought they were in Christ but really weren't. Now, I'm not telling you this to make anybody doubt your salvation. But if since the day you professed Christ or put your faith in Christ, nothing has changed, we need to have a talk, a personal one-on-one -on -one discussion because there will be sanctification. Then he closes this whole thing off by, in verse 23, this is one of the best known passages in scripture. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. A couple of things I want to tell you about this. Wages here, I know it's pretty clear, but it is, it's taken from a, a, a military context where the Soldiers were given their wages, their monthly allotment of food, and that kind of thing, but they worked for it. They earned it. A wage is a paycheck. And those of you who have ever had a paycheck or are still getting a paycheck, you know that you work for that. You are owed that. You deserve that paycheck. I've run businesses where I had to pay people, and I have paid them happily because they worked for it. They made me money. But it was deserved. I would have been wrong to withhold it, correct? The wages of sin is death. A person who is lost in their sin, who never comes to Christ, they're going to get exactly what they deserve. I don't, I'm not happy about that. God even says in his word that he is not happy about the death of the wicked. But they bring it to themselves. It's been one of those days, has it not? So the wages of sin are death. Who's your master? Who's your master? Is he? Who's your master? Are you living for him? Are you doing everything in your power to obey what you know he wants you to do? Are you faithful to what he has called you to do? I'm just asking the question. I'm, I want you to think. Are you serving the right master? You see, these passages ought to make us stop and think. Look at ourselves. And say this prayer. Lord, show me where I'm failing you. If you truly love your Lord and want to serve him to the best of your ability, that'll be a regular prayer of your show me. Quinn and I have been praying this. We've been having weekly meetings just to pray. And you know, it starts with us, right, brother? I know it's happened to him and I know it's happened to me. I've been praying, Lord, show me where I'm falling down. Show me where I've messed up. Show me if there's sin in my life that I have not taken care of. And you know, some things he shows me hurts. I can't expect holiness from my flock if I'm not pursuing it as well. And so we have to work together on this because the best part of this passage is in the second half of verse 23. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, most translations don't have the word free, but a gift, it's implied that it's free by definition. But I like it. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Those of you who are saved and you know it, you've known it for a long time, you have no doubt about it at all, or your doubt is so minuscule it doesn't matter. Did you do anything to get it? Did you obey the Ten Commandments like 98% of the time in your life and then God gave you salvation? No. Um, did you tie the whole bunch of money to the church and God saved you because of that? Anybody? You can be as rich as Michael Bloomberg and instead of spending it on a campaign, you give it to the church and it's still not going to get you into heaven. It'll get him a big tax write-off, but that's about it. 
These Christians in this room, you know you didn't do anything to gain your salvation. That's why it's called a gift of God throughout Scripture. It says it's the grace of God. I can't explain to you, Miss Ine, why he looked at me one day and he said, I'm going to save that boy. I don't know why he did it, except that it was his will. That satisfies me. I don't need to ask 50 silly questions about, well, you know, what about this about God? What about this? What about this? No. All I know is one day, well, from before time started, God chose you. How about that? Before anything existed, he said, Aini Seguin, she's going to live one day, and I'm, she's going to be mine. How's, that's cool. That is amazing. And then one day, the grace of God reached out to me, and I believed. I didn't believe up to that point. Oh, we went to church. His kids, to me, it was a good time. Just like we talked about in Sunday school, I went to be entertained. And then everything changed. This Jesus that I had come to know, I knew I needed to know him better. And so I began to read my Bible. I began to pursue him. Did I fall away a little bit? As when I was a teenager, oh, yeah. And, Mom, you don't know the half of it. <laughs> you don't need to know. But he brought me back to himself. I didn't lose my salvation. You know what he did? He kind of sometimes I think God will let us go off into the darkness a little bit. He'll let us go. And he's still watching. He's still in control. But he knows the only way a stubborn, hard-headed people are going to learn anything is to suffer and to hurt and to experience failure. And then we learn when he calls us back. He says, come here. He said, come here. My first station overseas, the same place I was doing that job I described to you. I had a room in the barracks all to myself, which was unusual as an E3. <laughs> all of a sudden, I got a roommate. His name was Stuart Smart. A good name, too, because he was a really smart guy. He was a dyed-in-the-wool, card-carrying, serious Christian boy. And he brought me back out of that black, backslidden condition. And I started fellowshipping with other Christian brothers. And it wasn't very long after that that he brought my sweet wife into my life. And then she got saved. But we know it. Look, look. Is he still working on me, Diana, do you think? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And trust me, he's still got a lot of work to do. A lot. But there will come a day, we're going to preach now. There will come a day when this body will be put in the ground. Well, I'm getting cremated, but same point. But at the moment of my passing, come on, at that exact millisecond, I will be in the presence of Jesus. And then one day I'll get that new body. But hear me, folks. This is the promise we have as Christians. This is our inheritance. This is our adoption. All the other words in Scripture that's used. This is what we have to look forward to. We are delivered from sin. We don't have to sin anymore, Steve, but we still do. And do you know why when we do? It's because we chose to. So we've got to reckon this to be true. Listen to me. Everything I've told you today is straight from Scripture. It is correct. It is not complicated. There's only two possibilities. Who's your master? Who's your master? And, you know, I want you all to really think about this. If you say God is your master, Christ is your master, then glory. I'm, I'm thankful for that. And I believe it to be so. But if he's your master... Are you following and obeying him like you should? Are there things you need to take care of there? All right? This is questions we need to always ask ourselves. This is not doubt of our salvation. This is what we need to do as Christians. Always be in a posture where we're looking to be better, to be more like Christ, to be more obedient, to serve him. Who's your master? Who's your master? I want to ask you a question. I'll close with this. I finally got to my notes. 
Um, now, we know Jesus is real. If we're Christian, you know he's real, right? Okay, and he is in human bodily form. He's in heaven. It's a spiritual body now, but he's in heaven. Holy Spirit lives within each of us. But I want to ask you this. What if, this is just kind of a little thought experiment. Think about the way you live your life day in and day out. What if Jesus decided to come and move in with you physically? The actual Jesus of Nazareth moves in with you. All right, and he's just going to sit in that easy chair over there and just observe your life. You get up and go somewhere, he's going to follow you. And you can see him, you can touch him. You can hear him if he talks to you. This is hard. What would you do different? What do you need to change? But I want you to know, he might not be physically sitting in that chair right there, but he sees it all. And through his Holy Spirit, he is with each of us. That is real.